Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome. I'm Sandy Quinn, uh, former president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. Now, um, <laughs> thank you, now a member of the board. And I want you to meet uh, my successor, uh, who just started this week, so give him a good welcome, uh, Bill Barabal. Where are you, Bill? Um, <laughs> yeah, he's in the back. <laughs> See, Bill, we always have full houses, so you're going to have to get used to just standing in the back. Um, uh, I want you to say hello to uh, Jim Rogan's wife, Christine, and to <laughs> welcome Christine, and to his all-important mother-in-law, Trudy. Trudy? <laughs> I want you to know that on July 21, and save the date, mark this down, it's gonna be a great program. We have Pat Buchanan, who joined uh, candidate Richard Nixon uh, in, uh, right after he lost the two big elections of um, presidency and the gubernatorial here in California. And he joined him from the St. Louis, St. Louis Globe Dispatch where he was the ed chief editorial writer. And he traveled with Richard Nixon throughout those wilderness years and wrote a book just recently called The Greatest Comeback, which is a story of how Richard Nixon went from the depths of those two defeats to the White House, not once but twice. And Pat Buchanan was with him the entire time. He'll be joined by his wife, Shelley, who he met in the White House. They're a great couple, they're great people. He is on, uh, uh, you've seen him uh, as a talking head, a commentator on television frequently. Uh, he's on uh, John McLaughlin's show, he's on Fox frequently, and he'll be here on July 21, speaking at seven o'clock, and tickets are available in the, uh, in the gift shop. Now, those of you who follow us frequently know that we have a tremendous schedule of speakers all the time, and we do now. So I want you to go to the website, www.nixonfoundation.org, and see what's coming up, because we've got great speakers, we've got some very interesting engagements with our friends in the People's Republic of China, who will be here three times this year with interesting programs, including July 23rd, a program you're welcome to, where they will uh, open a exhibit that the Chinese have done thanking America for uh, the country's support during World War II. And it'll be a great exhibit, and we're going to display it for 10 days, and I hope you'll come to the reception on the evening of July 23rd at 7 o'clock. I always want you to, um, to help us and to join us and to be with us uh, all the time, year-round. Thus, I hold in my formerly nicotine-stained hands an application to join our Associates Club. How many of you are members of the Associates Club? Well, good for you, but shame on the rest of you. <laughs> we need your help. You can join at $50, up to 5000 And yes, there are some spots left in the $5,000 category. <laughs> but we welcome you at any category. And you get free admission, you get discounts to days like today. Uh, on merchandise, uh, but you get, uh, you get free admission all year. So it's worth it, but you're helping a good cause. Um, Jim Rogan is one of the most fascinating and diverse people in terms of, of background that any of us will ever meet. Uh, he has an amazing story, a hard to believe story. Uh, it began in the Mission District, uh, in San Francisco, now a nice renaissance area of restaurants and shops. Then um, a, a uh, decadent, rundown, tough, uh, full of gang uh, area. He was, he was born to a mother who was a, a felon. She was a cocktail waitress on welfare. His father left him before he was born. And that's a tough beginning. He had a very rough childhood. 
He dropped out of high school in the 10th grade. Had no purpose, uh, had no mission, had no hope. But like a lot of people, he, he decided this isn't for me. And he got up and he dusted himself off and he said, I'm going to do something with my life. I don't like this life. I want to change. So he went to community college and he was, he was a great student. So he went to Cal State Berkeley and graduated. He went to UCLA and got his law degree. Then he joined a firm, tried corporate and, and practice in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a firm, but he said, I like public service. So he became a district attorney and in Los Angeles. And the DA recognized early that he was an excellent um, prosecutor. He knew a little bit about gangs, so he became in charge of that gang murder unit in the LA District Attorney's Office. And he was exceptional in that. Uh, Governor Duke Magian decided that he should be on the court, on the bench. So he named him to the state court, the municipal court in Glendale. He was the youngest at that time of judges in, this, in that system of municipal judges in the state of California. And he was exceptional. California Law Review said he was one of the most effective of all of the judges in California. So a special election came along in his home district. So he said, what the heck, I'll try it. Well, he won. So as a freshman, a young freshman, he goes to Sacramento and he becomes majority leader of the state assembly. There again, California Law Review says he's one of the most effective legislators in the, in the state. So along comes an opportunity for Congress and he runs for that and he wins. And he goes to Washington and he's named on the all important judiciary committee. And he then becomes uh, involved in the, in the uh, as a floor manager in the impeachment process for the president. Uh, he uh, becomes kind of a marked man because of that and loses his congressional seat later, but then comes back to California where he's uh, now a member of the Superior Court right here in Orange County, so be careful, be nice to him. Um, and he's an adjunct professor at Chapman University teaching law and, and, uh, and court procedures and uh, trial procedures. Um, so his early life was, was nothing but rough edges, and thus this book, uh, which, by the way, purely coincidental, we happen to have on sale in our museum <laughs> store, which is available to you. You buy one, the second one will be sold to you at exactly no increase in price. <laughs> and he will autograph it later. Um, so from that rough edge life, he goes to phenomenal success. I think that's the great America dream uh, lived to its absolute. And it's an example of what focus and persistence can do uh, for any of us and all of us. And a, an amazing man who comes here today to talk about his new book, And Then I Met. So to go from rough edges, where he's hanging out with gang people, to And Then I Met, where he's hanging out with the biggest celebrities, political people, presidents, senators, governors, um, world leaders, uh, is an amazing career. And to tell you more about it, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Rogan. Thank you, Senator. That was great. Let me borrow that for a second. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, if you'll, as we used to say in Congress, if you'll allow me a point of personal privilege, uh, I just uh, want to say about Sandy Quinn, I've known him for about 25 years. Uh, he was uh, introduced to me many years ago by our mutual friend, Bob Finch who served in President Nixon's uh, first cabinet. And uh, I've watched Sandy with his activity here at the library and in the foundation over the many years. 
Uh, he just spent the last several years as the foundation president and just retired uh, a few weeks ago and was succeeded by Bill, uh, who you met earlier. And uh, I just want to say, Sandy, you've been an absolute great president. You've been a great member of our community. And I want to salute you for all that you've done here at the foundation and at the library. <laughs> my uh, kind words for you are much shorter than your kind words for me. That's because I needed you to hawk my book for me. Uh, <laughs> This is uh, also, if you will, uh, allow me to just say, this is my third book. And uh, each one of my books I have uh, kicked off here at the uh, Nixon Library. Uh, this brand new one is actually not published. Uh, it'll be published in four days. But uh, they've got copies of uh, it here today. And so I'm just grateful to the library and the staff here. Uh, this is, I, I've visited a number of libraries, and I must tell you, from the volunteers, the docents, and everybody here at the library and on the foundation staff, uh, they are just wonderful. And for those of you that live in Orange County, especially North Orange County, you know uh, how many free things that they have going on here all the time uh, for our community. They are just wonderful uh, and dedicated uh, people, and I want to salute them and thank them also for all they do for us here. We do have uh, gifts for our parting contestants today. Uh, I brought to the library and uh, turned them in uh, at the gift shop a stack of uh, these brochures that uh, are all signed and everybody will get one uh, whether they have a book uh, today or if they order it online. And I want to just tell you a quick story about this brochure. It is an impeachment memento. And the reason it is a President Clinton impeachment memento, vintage memento, uh, is this. Uh, I was one of the House prosecutors that uh, tried the case, and uh, I was one of the final uh, guys doing the closing argument in President Clinton's impeachment trial. And it was go at, uh, all the president's lawyers spoke, all of the House managers spoke. We were down to the last couple, and then the impeachment trial was going to be history, done forever. And uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist looked at me to call on me, and he said, we'll take a break. And so I was all keyed up and ready to go, and I had this let down for a few minutes. And so I went into the back room. And uh, in the back room, getting ready to do my final closing argument in the president's impeachment trial, I hear this talking head on TV just trashing the House managers for being these horrible people doing this to the poor president. And I got so irritated and angry that I took my closing argument that I had prepared and honed and crafted. This is what I wanted history to remember me as having said. Why I was involved in this impeachment. I got so upset and irritated, I X'd out like three quarters of it. I walked onto the Senate floor a few minutes later. I winged the whole thing, and it was all right, I guess. But uh, all I, I went back to my office, and all I did was start complaining and grousing that I let somebody irritate me. And this is what I wanted my great-grandchildren. This was my voice from the grave as to why I impeached the president. And my staff, after a few months, got so sick of hearing me complain that I didn't give the speech I had prepared. I came in one day, there was this big box on my desk with 5,000 of these beautiful, glossy, uh, with you know, flags and color picture and everything, and they, you know, it's paid for by Rogan for Congress, so this is from 1999, and they said, look, we don't want to hear this anymore. We've made 5,000 of these things, and we're gonna, for the rest of your life in Congress, everywhere you go, anybody writes you, we're going to send them, you know, it just, it, we're going to give these things out by the droves. And, uh, when we go through the first 5,000, we'll order the next 5,000, and after 20 years, the whole world will know what you intended to say. And that was really, that was very kind of them. The problem was, uh, as Sandy mentioned, I was a conservative Republican congressman representing most of the Hollywood movie studios, where the polling in my district showed if you vote to impeach the president, 75% of the registered voters in your district will never vote for you again. Uh, as it turned out, that was not true. Only 60% of them never voted for me again. <laughs> and so I, I, I came home with 4,950 <laughs> of these brochures. And so the real reason I keep writing book after book after book is I feel if I, can get pe if I come to book signings, I just keep throwing these at people and pass them out. I will at some point be ready for the uh, second run of these 5,000. And so. Uh, and I, by, in, in that vein, I want to thank our friends from C-SPAN. They have covered all three of my uh, kickoffs, and uh, I want to thank you also for helping to clear out my garage uh, with these <laughs> brochures. Uh, let me just take a moment, if I may, a couple of minutes, and talk about how I ended up becoming an author. It wasn't something that I intended to do. Right after I was defeated for re-election, I got a phone call from uh, Speaker Newt Gingrich, former speaker, 
And uh, he didn't ask, he just told me, meet me at McCormick and Schmidt's for lunch at four, you know, two o'clock and we're gonna talk. And so I showed up there and if any of you know or have met Newt, he's got the most peripatetic mind in the world. The table was covered, he had blackberries and computers and he had like four different notepads going on. And he sits me down and he says, okay, here's what you're gonna do. Uh, you're gonna write several books and, uh, but you're not gonna write about impeachment. That's not your first book. Uh, you're gonna have to write this book about your early life. And, uh, and I kind of interjected and said, I don't think anybody will care. Nobody's gonna be interested. I don't know, just don't you know, listen to what I'm telling you. And then he starts like telling me what to title it and he starts outlining the book for me. And he connects me with his agent, uh, Jillian Manitz. And uh, so she becomes my agent and she told me, okay, fine. Uh, I like the story, I'll represent you, we'll hook you up with a ghostwriter. And I said, well, no, I don't want a ghostwriter, I want to write this myself. And it was just like I had just dropped an atomic bomb in the middle of the room. She just looked at me and she said, Congressman, I don't want to offend you, but may I tell you, okay, strike one, you're a politician, strike two, you're a lawyer, uh, boring, boring, you, you, this is not going to happen. You need a ghostwriter and uh, writing a book for publication, that's a big deal. And I said, but I'm Irish and I'm an ex-bartender. I know how to tell a story, so would you <laughs> let me take a whack at it. And it took me about 45 minutes and finally she patted me on the head like a little errant child. And Jillian said, okay, you go write your chapter or two and you send them to me and when I tell you that they're horrible, then we'll, you know, no more talk about the ghostwriter. So I went home and did the first couple of chapters of Rough Edges and she emailed me and she said, when can I have the third chapter? Uh, the book came out 10 years ago and uh, it uh, sold out. The book's been out of print for eight years. Uh, Reader's Digest picked it as one of their top four nonfiction books of 2004. And uh, I am pleased to say that after eight years of being out of print, uh, it just was republished in a 10th anniversary edition uh, last April. And so uh, it's a great book. However, I must warn you, uh, it is not for the faint of heart because as Sandy indicated, uh, I came from kind of a rough background my mom was a single mom with four kids on welfare and food stamps in and out of jail. Uh, Sandy is polite to say that I was drop, a dropout from high school. Technically, I was technically expelled in the 10th grade. It's a minor difference, but I'm just trying to keep it all straight here. And uh, if you want to know how I got from that background to getting through college and law school, it was doing all kinds of elegant jobs. Among them, I was a uh, bouncer at a porno theater, I was a bartender at a female mud wrestling bar, I was also a bartender at a female hot oil wrestling bar. There is a status difference if you're not familiar with the two. Uh, mud wrestling here, hot oil, there's a little below there. And uh, in between jobs I sold vacuum cleaners door to door to all the brothels in Oakland and Berkeley. And so uh, all of those stories are in there and uh, as I said, it's not quite for everybody. But the the second book I wrote was about impeachment. It was about uh, President Clinton's uh, impeachment, and it's called Catching Our Flag, Behind the Scenes of a Presidential Impeachment. And that was the book that I wanted to write for history. And uh, the genesis of that book was I got on the Judiciary Committee about 12 hours before the Monica Lewinsky story hit the press. Uh, it was just a matter of fate. I, I kept telling Henry Hyde, the chairman, I didn't want to be on Judiciary Committee. Uh, Sonny Bono was killed in a skiing accident. Henry you know, imposed on me and told me you need to do this. I finally said yes and the next morning the Lewinsky story was all over the papers and we were off to the races. And the, what I, I, as soon as that happened I knew two things about this story. Number one, it will never lead to a presidential impeachment. But number two, in the event it did, somebody needs to tell the truth, somebody needs to make sure the history gets right. And so from that first moment until the last gavel sounded, uh, almost a year and a half later. Every behind the scenes meeting, every private leadership meeting that I was at, I sat with my legal pad on my lap and I got the words down as they were coming out of people's mouths because I knew that revisionist history someday would distort and not tell the truth. Uh, that is right from my diaries and I have to tell you, my first book, the response I got, I got hundreds and hundreds of letters from people over the years from my first book and they all said the same thing. I loved your book, it made me laugh, it made me cry. The almost universal response I got from Catching Our Flag is, I read your book, I've never been so angry in my entire life. And uh, all of the guys I worked with that are still around, I haven't heard from any of them. I think some of them were kind of upset that I told too many stories out of uh, school. I wanted to tell the truth for America. Uh, when I was doing a book signing a few years ago on this book, uh, somebody asked me a question and I told the uh, lady candidly, 
I did not write the book for any of you here. If you want to get it, help yourself, that's fine. I wrote this book for future generations of historians who are not uh, wedded to the mainstream media of today and who might like to know what really went down behind the scenes. And this book here stands for one proposition, uh, like the old saying, if you love politics, if you, uh, uh, po people who love politics and sausage should never see how either is made. And so that's my uh, second book. Uh, my new book, uh, that Sand the reason I'm here to talk about it today, and I'm going to tell a few stories from it, is Catching Our Flag. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, and then I met, the subtitle is Stories of Growing Up, Meeting Famous People, and Annoying the Hell Out of Them. And uh, this book is actually part of a trilogy, because what I was able to do with this book was go back uh, and explain through these kind of stories how this street kid from this incredibly dysfunctional life as a young person, without really any hope at all of even, you know, having a modicum of success, was able to turn that ship around because I had a great interest, even as a little boy. My interest was in history, politics, and government. And I found from the time I was a little kid, you know, it's interesting to read about these uh, leaders and so forth in history, uh, in books and in newspapers, but it would be even far more interesting if I could get down and meet them myself and ask them for advice and get to meet them and kind of take their measure, because I wanted to run for Congress someday. From the time I was, even when I was like throwing rocks at police cars, I was thinking, well, this is just a sideline. <laughs> you know, someday I'll, you know, and I was smoking dope with my buddies and watching them hotwire cars so we could, you know, go joyriding. I was thinking, you know, but someday I'd like to be a congressman and there must be a way somehow. <laughs> and so. Even though I was, you know, this incredibly dysfunctional background, I had this profound interest in politics, government, and history. And so what I started to do as a little kid, little kids in the audience, I don't recommend this, but I started cutting school all the time. I would pick up the newspaper in the morning and see, oh, President Nixon's coming to town. Oh, Hubert Humphrey's coming to town. Oh, you know, so-and-so is coming to town. I'd cut school, take the bus, uh, get dropped off in downtown San Francisco, figure out where the hotel was, and my goal was to get past the police, the security, the Secret Service, the TV cameras, and everybody else, so I could get in and have that guy tell me, uh, you know, what's it like to be in Congress, what's it like to be president, what's it like to do these things, and I was not going to take no for an answer. And so, uh, the way this book is constructed, it's about uh, 50 short chapters, uh, each chapter illustrated with pictures, uh, my editor on this book didn't want to use the pictures because he said, well, you know, they're really not professional quality. And I said, you know, that's not part of the charm. The charm is I had a $12 Instamatic Kodak plastic camera, and I got it when, so when you see these close-up pictures that I took of these guys in the book, I was right up in their grill. It had the little flash bulb, remember, that would rotate, and you, <laughs> you know, and I mean, I didn't have the camera with the lenses. I had this plastic camera, and that's what I used, and so, uh, they did me, uh, my publisher, uh, WND Books, did me a great favor. They decided, okay, we're not going to put the glossy insert in the middle with just a handful of pictures. We're going to just illustrate every single chapter with uh, some of your pictures. And so these are some of the stories uh, that are in the book, and I, uh, I just want to go over a few of them with you just to kind of give you a flavor. Some of my favorite stories. A couple of them I touched on briefly in my first book, but I really didn't get the chance because of editing to expand on the story, so I want to tell you a few of them today. Uh, this first story that uh, I want to talk about in the book involves President Harry S. Truman. Now, I love this picture of President Truman. If you can't read it from the back of the room, it's inscribed to me. Uh, the reason I love it, it's one of my favorite pieces in my collection. Uh, people for years have seen that hanging on my office wall and they think, oh, your grandfather got that from Harry Truman. No, I got that from Harry Truman. And the way I got it from Harry Truman was this. I was in the seventh grade, and my teacher, Mr. Poor, who was just really, I can say this because he died, he was really just a horrible guy, and just, <laughs> just terrible teacher, and I just, I didn't like him. And uh, anyway, but he gave us an assignment. And uh, he said, I'm giving, this is my first long-term homework assignment I ever had. He said, uh, you have to pick somebody in history, you have to type a paper, it has to be seven or eight pages long, uh, you got three months to do it, and this is, you know, kids, I know you don't even know what a typewriter is. This was back in the days when if you wanted to type something, you had to put your finger on a key and you had to jam it down and the thing hit a ribbon. And if you made a mistake, you had to start all over. So it was like a big deal. We needed three months to do this. But I decided I'm going to do my report on Harry Truman. And uh, I had all these books on presidents. And so I did mine in three days. And I was done. And I had three months to go. And I had read in one of President Truman's books 
that one of the only obligation he felt he had as a former president was to answer letters from young people. So I sent him my report. And uh, dear President Truman, uh, you know, I got this report. Why don't you read through it, tell me what you think, and, uh, you know, get it back to me, because uh, I got to turn it in in three months. And, uh, you know, and this was also, young people, this was before the advent of, like, copying machines. I know you just can't get your head around this, that there were no, you know, if you wanted to make a copy of something, you had to put a piece of carbon paper, and I didn't even know about cars. So it was the only, the only thing I had. I mailed this to Harry Truman, and it's just gone. And so three months later, the day comes to turn in my report, and uh, Mr. Poor collects everybody's reports. He says, where's yours? And I told him the story. Well, actually, I did mine three months ago. It's really good. And I sent it to Harry Truman, and he must like it because he still has it. And <laughs> but, you know, when I get it back, I'll turn it in, and everything will be fine. And uh, he called me in front of the class. He humiliated me. He called me a liar. He said, none of this is true. You didn't do your report. He gave me an F. And then in front of everybody, he wagged his finger at me, and he said, and besides, Harry Truman's dead. He died 20 years ago. I watched his funeral on television. And I said, well, respectfully, he's not dead. He's got my report. And when he's done with it, you know, <laughs> I'll turn it in. Months go by. I came home from school one day. I was at my great aunt Della's house. And she's got this big smile on her face. And she said, something came for you. And she hands me this white envelope. And here is this big envelope from Independence, Missouri, with this great signed picture by President and Mrs. Truman. And this is not the most valuable item in my collection, but it, if I had to pick one, it's my favorite. This letter from President Harry Truman that says, Dear Jim, I was very pleased to have your letter and manuscript. I am sorry I cannot help you with it, as I have a rule against working on another author's paper. However, it's clear that you did your homework well with best wishes for success in your life, Harry Truman. The next day. <laughs> at Ben Franklin Junior High in Daly City, California, when that bell rang, if you were not in your seat, you had to go to the office and get a late slip. I stood outside the door of my classroom and waited for the bell to ring. I counted off about two minutes, and then I walked in. And Mr. Poor said the magic words, where's your late slip, Rogan? And I said, I have it right here, Mr. Poor. And I walked up to his desk, and I put that paper down. I put my paper down. I put the letter down, and I put the picture down. And I just stood there. And he looked at these things, and he said these words, go to your desk. I said, Mr. Poor, is that all you have to say to me? He said, yes, go to your desk. So I sat down at my desk. When the bell rang for recess, I ran to the door, blocked it with my body, held up the letter in the picture, and I yelled to all my classmates, if any of you would like to see the letter and the autographed picture I got yesterday from the late president, Harry Truman, I'll be out on the playground, happy to show it to you. Mr. Poor gave me a C. He hands me back the paper. First, he said he wasn't going to take it. And I went down to Mrs. Zenovich, the principal, and I laid out the whole story, and she said, follow me. She walked into the classroom, and I saw her doing this to Mr. Poor. Next thing I know, he takes the paper. He gives it back. He gives me a C. And I asked him, President Truman likes me. What, what are you giving me a C for? He told me, I'm marking you down for repeated punctuation errors. I said, well, what's the punctuation error? He said, Throughout the paper, wherever you put down Harry S. Truman, you didn't put a period after the S. And I said, it doesn't get a period. And he tells Leif Carlson, bring me the Encyclopedia Britannica, volume T. It was either Leif or Dan Kelleher. I can't remember now. My memory's not perfect, but you get the point. He opens the Encyclopedia Britannica in front of the class. It says, Harry S. Period Truman. Aha, Mr. Rogan. The Encyclopedia says it gets a period. And I said, well, they're wrong. Oh, is our how, students, how lucky we are. Mr. Rogan is smarter than the Encyclopedia Britannica. My, how fortunate. And so for like the next two weeks, I'm getting this. Columbus discovered America in 1492. Or Mr. Rogan, was it 1493? I got sick of it. I went home one day from school. Dear President Truman, <laughs> you're not going to believe this jackass teacher, but you know that report I, I sent you? And I mailed the letter, just never gone, and the school year ended, and that was it. Toward the end of summer, between seventh and eighth grade, I come home from 
uh, playing one day, and there's another letter from Harry Truman. A very lengthy letter, and he's explaining in the letter, I had two grandfathers, one was named Solomon, one was named Ship. My parents didn't know what to do. They just gave me an S. They didn't want to pick between the two. People use it with a period or without a period, and for the very first time I noticed his own letterhead had no period. Harry S. No period Truman. I didn't have Mr. Poor as an eighth grade teacher, but the first day of school I showed up in his classroom and he looked at me like I was an idiot. You know, what are you doing here? You're not in my class. And I said, I have something to show you. And I gave him the letter. He refused to upgrade my grade. And I looked at him and I said, Mr. Poor, <clears throat> you know, there's an easy way to do this and there's a hard way to do this. <laughs> Do you, do you need a little more Mrs. Zenovich therapy? Do I need to? So he, gave, he, he finally agreed to give me the A, but as I was walking out the door, he called my name. He said, Rogan. And as I, I turned back, I looked at him, he peered at me, and he said, I am very glad you're not in my class this year. <laughs> so that's, well, that was my Harry Truman uh, story. Uh, I don't want to spend... Uh, <laughs> I want to go through a few more stories quickly because I don't want to use up all my time. But this, this lady here, that's my wife, by the way, and, and me. This lady here, some of, this name may sound familiar to some of you, Evelyn Lincoln. She was personal secretary to John F. Kennedy for 12 years. She started with him in the House of Representatives. She was with him in the motorcade in Dallas. And since we're at the Nixon Library, I thought I could talk, tell a couple quick stories about the major opponents President Nixon had. Uh, when uh, he was uh, running for president. And of course, his first major opponent was President Kennedy. Uh, Chris and I had a wonderful three or four hour dinner with Mrs. Lincoln, who, as she had more glasses of wine, she told more stories, <laughs> and I was more than happy in the book to repeat them all. But uh, just a very quick story that she shared about uh, Senator John F. Kennedy. When he was running against Vice President Richard Nixon, uh, she told me that uh, Senator Kennedy would, was often plagued by laryngitis. And he would get, he'd lose his voice and he'd get a sore throat. And she had a suggestion. She said, why don't you call Senator Everett Dirksen and see if he has uh, any kind of memory. Now you have to be older than I to know who Ev Dirksen was, but back in the 50s and 60s, one of the most prominent members of the Senate, he was the Republican uh, leader in the Senate. He was a big, tall, lanky senator from Illinois, had a shock of white hair and he had the most mellifluous voice of anybody in maybe in American history. His voice was so beautiful, uh, they got him to make a couple of albums uh, where he spoke the words to patriotic songs and he won a Grammy for it. And so, and he always spoke like this, my dear boy. He called everybody my dear boy. So uh, he had this beautiful speaking voice. So Kennedy calls Ev Dirksen, the Republican Senate leader, and says, Ev, you know, I'm on the campaign trail, it's getting down to the wire, I keep losing my voice. Do you have any suggestion for me? Is there anything I can do? And Dirksen tells Kennedy, my dear boy, you know, I used to be plagued with laryngitis uh, over the years, and I found a way to cure it. He said, well, tell, to Ev, tell me, I need it. And he said, what I do every day, I can't remember if it was Pons or Noxzema now, I get a jar of Pons cold cream, and I eat three or four spoonfuls of it. <laughs> and it coats my throat, and I just never have had laryngitis. Oh, Ev, thank you very much. He hangs up the phone, he turns to Evelyn, he said, go down to the Rexall, uh, down there, get me a case of Pond's Coal or Noxzema, whatever it was, cold cream, and get it up here right away. She said, Senator Kennedy sat down with a big spoon from downstairs, opens this jar, gags down a spoonful of cold cream, gags down a second one, just he's, now he's choking, he gags down a third, I don't know, I feel better already. And uh, he goes out, campaigns, the next day he comes in, where's my cold cream? He does this for like three days. And Mrs. Lincoln's telling him, you know, Senator, I'm not really noticing any improvement. No, no, it's better, it's better. Like by about the fourth or fifth day, as he's just choking down cold cream now by the jar, she looks at him and she said, you know, Senator, did it ever dawn on you that Senator Dirksen might have been pulling your leg? <laughs> And she, she said, John F. Kennedy sat there in his hotel room with his jar of cold cream and a big spoon. He looked at her and he said, that damn Ev Dirksen. And he threw the jar and threw the spoon across the room. <laughs> this is uh, Hubert Humphrey and uh, former vice president, ran against President Nixon in 1968. That's me, by the way. I got through a whole bunch of security to, you know, 
uh, get through uh, to meet Senator Humphrey, Vice President Humphrey, one of the sweetest men in American politics, just a lovely, charming, darling guy. And uh, he was going to be at KPIX uh, TV studio in San Francisco when he was running for president. My, I had my little brother, Pat. Uh, I always brought Pat along to do the dirty work for me. Uh, he was my little brother. I was like 12. Pat was maybe 10. And so we'd all cut school. We'd sneak out of the house, get on the bus, and off we'd go. And uh, Humphrey was running for president. He was at KPIX studio. And we, I had this quotation of his that I wanted him to write out for me. Uh, it wasn't likely he would do it, but I was going to ask. I thought it would be a great addition to my collection. And Humphrey just blew past everybody out of the limousine and just into the studio. And I thought, hmm, this isn't really working. And so I told Pat, come here. I reached into my pocket. I had brought like eight of these big Hubert Humphrey for president buttons. And we just pinned them all over our shirts. And we stood outside the studio. Humphrey's running out the door when he, it's time to leave. As he's getting in the car, I'm doing, I'm doing this. And he looks at me, and he comes running over. And he says to Pat and me, oh, boy, am I for you. What can I do for you, boys? And I said, well, you know. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I got this quote. It's really a nice quote. And all the Secret Service guys are out there. I said, I was thinking, you know, it'd be really nice if you would write this out for me on a sheet of Senate stationery. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry. You know, I don't have a sheet of Senate stationery with me. I said, I do. And, <laughs> and the reason I did is my brother and I cut school a couple months earlier when the U.S. Senate had a subcommittee hearing in San Francisco. And when the senators left, I'm looking at the podium, and I said to Pat, my little brother, you see that gavel up there? That would really be nice in my collection. Uh, and I see there's a pad of stationery. Why don't you go grab what's up there while I divert everybody's attention? And he went and grabbed this stuff. And so, you know, I, got, I can tell these stories now. The statute of limitations is passed. I mean, come on. You know, come on. So I ended up with this pad of so Senate stationery. And Humphrey says, well, I don't have any place to write it. And Pat goes, there's a mailbox down on the corner. Secret Service are going nuts. Senator, get in the car. He's like, no, no. And so he goes to the mailbox. Hubert Humphrey, what a sweet kid. Two little kids, no TV cameras around to record this or anything. Hubert Humphrey, take, follow me, boys. He takes us down to the corner, stands at a mailbox, and writes this out. If I am permitted to be president, I intend to be president. I've noticed most presidents are like that. They don't take orders from vice presidents or anyone else. Hubert Humphrey, as vice president, is a member of a team. Hubert Humphrey, as president, is captain of a team. There's a lot of difference. Hubert H. Humphrey. And uh, just what a great guy. Um, later that afternoon, he went to the Fairmont Hotel, and he was meeting with people who were slated to be his delegates. And I saw in the back room, we called them in those days stewardesses. Now they're flight attendants. But there were these stewardesses with the pillbox hats. And they were kind of looking in. And Humphrey glanced back, and he saw all these stewardesses. And he runs over the door, ladies, come on in, come on in, glad to meet you. He's shaking all of their hands. And they're just giggling, and they're so excited to meet Hubert Humphrey. And he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out these gold HHH pins. And he says, uh, oh, these are for my special friends, and I want to give one to each one of you. And the stewardesses were all in line. And the first one puts out her hand, and Humphrey blew past her hand, and with the swiftness of a 16-year-old boy in the back seat of a Chevy, he got his hand up into her blouse, unbuttoned the first two buttons, and pinned this gold <laughs> pin on her. And then he walked right down the line doing it. And I'm standing there with my little brother, Pat, and we're kind of watching this. And somebody in the background, his wife's name was Muriel, kind of laughed and said, hey, Muriel's going to give you hell for this. And Humphrey turned to me, he looked at me, and he said, Ah, the joys of running for president. <laughs> and later, when he was leaving, I shook hands with him and I said, uh, you know, Senator, that whole thing you did with those stewardesses, that was really cute. I said, uh, if you give me a pin, I'll keep my mouth shut about it. <laughs> Humphrey looked at me for a moment, reached into his pocket, and 42 years ago, that's the pin he gave me right there. So. Sandy, do I have about 10 more minutes? Yeah. All right. I, this is a quick story. Uh, this is the seal of the Republican National Convention from 1972, President Nixon's convention. Uh, I was 14 years old, and I was on everybody's list because I collected campaign buttons. So I would just write to every campaign, oh, I support you. Please send me campaign buttons. And I got this thing in the mail from the Republicans in 1972 saying for $240, we've got this Young Voters for the President deal going on. And uh, for $240, we will fly you round trip from San Francisco to Miami Beach. 
Uh, you get a week in Miami, hotel and meals paid, and you can come to the convention and, you know, be on the floor and be active as a young uh, Republican. I was a Democrat, but, you know, the Democrats didn't invite me to their convention. Apparently, the Republicans <laughs> did. The only stipulation is you had to be between the ages of 18 and uh, 30 to be a young voter for the president. I was 14. Uh, and so what I did was I took every dime I had from uh, part-time jobs, which was about $240, went down to 7-Eleven, got a money order, sent it in, put down I was 26, mailed it, and my credentials came in the mail. That was the easy part. The hard part was explaining to my mother, well, you see, Mom, I know I'm only 14, but I'm going to get on this airplane in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to be on the East Coast with no adult supervision for the next week uh, with, at a convention of 20,000 people. And she said, you can't go. And I said, Mom, they're Republicans. How much trouble can I get in? She said, <laughs> she said OK, you can go. And so I get on this plane. And some of you may have heard that I, I told this story the last time I was here. I get on this charter plane. That plane was, no, it was three seconds in the air when all these young voters for the president were out of their seats, took over the plane, broke into the liquor cabinets. It was like just this raucous, nightmarish party going on, it was a midnight flight, all the way to Miami Beach, and the only stiff person on the plane is the lady sitting next to me, uh, and I'll call her Bambi. And she, she got hair in a bun, and it was like right out of, you know, Pollyanna. Uh, high collar and this heavy wool skirt and cloddy shoes, and she was sitting there and she was chatting with me, she was very formal, but somebody came by and said to her, would you like a glass of wine? Why, yes, I would. And she drank a glass of wine. She drank another glass of wine. She drank another and another. And after about five or six glasses, I noticed like the bun is coming out of her hair <laughs> and the collar is getting undone. She's, is it hot in here? And we're over, we're somewhere over Salina, Kansas. And I'm 14, okay, I'm 14 years old. This woman who's drunk and just, you know, telling me how hot it is on the airplane. She looks at me and she says, She's looking at me like this, squinty eyes. She goes, you're really a nice guy. Can I, can I tell you a secret about myself? I'm like, yeah, sure, what? She said, well, I'm a nymphomaniac. <laughs> I went to public school, but I knew what that meant. <laughs> and then she looked at me and she said, how old are you? And I thought, OK, moment of truth. And so I sat there and I said, all right, Bambi. Um, I'm a, I gotta be honest with you. Uh, I got this thing in the mail. It was eight, you had to be 18 to 30. I lied about my age. I put down I was 26. I'm really not 26. She said, well, how old are you? I said, 32. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said in the book, as that airplane winged through the middle of the night to Miami Beach, it was that, that was the first moment I realized that there was indeed a very vigorous two-party system, and I should not be so narrow-minded about which one appealed to me the most. <laughs> Uh, if I have time for my final story uh, about Ronald Reagan, uh, this, I, I just I love this story. I love Ronald Reagan, and uh, that's me and Governor Reagan at the uh, Boundary Oaks restaurant in Walnut Creek. He was governor for seven bucks. You got to a reception, uh, a lunch, and a speech by Ronald Reagan. And I snuck in. And of course, I didn't have seven dollars. I break into the thing. I sneak in. I got to meet Ronald Reagan, but I noticed. When he was giving his speech, he was doing it with these four by six inch uh, handwritten note cards, and I decided I wanted these cards for my collection. When Reagan was done speaking, uh, they took him into some back room, and uh, he, was meet he was holed up with legislators, and there was a whole crowd of people waiting for him to come out, but after one, two, three hours, the crowd disappeared, and now it's just me and some kid. And uh, three hours go by, and finally one of Reagan's staffers just sees me and this other kid with a camera and said, you know, boys, he's not coming out this way, he's going out the back. And this kid got in front of me going through the door, and he was too slow. We, Reagan, we missed him. He came out the door, got into his limo, and the limo started pulling away. And this little boy with the brownie camera that was waiting, he stood there like this, his head dropped, and he started crying. And for some reason, Reagan looked back and sees this kid crying. And he taps somebody in front of him. The limousine stops. He backs it up. Reagan rolls down the window and says to the kid with the camera, son, were you waiting for me? And this kid just, you know, joyfully, oh, governor, thank Reagan, gets out, shakes his hand, poses for a picture with him. And so it just makes a big fuss over this kid. And I'm standing there. I'm about 14 or so, I guess, 14, 15. And Reagan then turns to me and he says, well, what can I do for you? And I'm not like this crybaby here. You know, I've got a, I got a, I got a plan. 
And so I start, I start laying on all oh, that speech you gave, Governor. That was like the best speech I've ever heard. Well, thank you. And oh, no, no, I just like, I just, I'm a student of this stuff. And, you know, and, and it looked like it was all handwritten. Did you handwrite it? Why, yes. I was up in the hotel. I spent three hours on that speech. And I said, can I see it? And he says, well, okay. And he hands it to me. And I looked at it. And I said, can I have it? And Ronald Reagan turned white. He just kind of rocked back on his heels. And he started explaining to me this was, this was Proposition 1, which became Prop 13, uh, his signature initiative. It was defeated as Prop 1. It passed as Prop 13. It was the first day he was kicking off the signature initiative of his, and he starts telling me, oh, I don't have a copy. It's all handwritten. I just, you know, and I, what I'm hearing is in a very nice way, he's blowing me off, right? And so I'm looking at this grinning kid with the camera, uh, and I'm, and I'm looking at Reagan telling me you can't have the speech notes, and I get an idea, and so, because I, I, I just go like this. <clears throat> <laughs> I just stand in there, and I, and I said, you know, yeah, Governor, I understand. You spent three hours on it. Go, I know all about three hours, Governor. That's how long I waited for you to ask, but uh, just, if, you, if you can't, you can't. And Reagan, Reagan goes like this. He goes, okay, you can have it. And I went just like this. They're no goddamn good if you don't autograph it, would you? <laughs> so, well, Reagan just looks at me, and just gets in the car and drives away. And so fast forward now about eight years. I'm in, I'm in law school at UCLA. I'm broke. I don't have enough money for tuition. I'm bartending at the old Palomino Club in North Hollywood, just this riotous place. And I had to come up with 1,500 bucks. I didn't have the money. I was going to lose my seat in law school. A collector offers me $1,500 for the speech notes. I told him no. And when I got down to the wire, I had no choice. And so I sold pages two through eight. I did not sell page one. I kept page one because I just had to keep something. And this is page one of the speech note. Um, I sold two through eight. That's what got me through law school and uh, led me on to my, so Ronald Reagan basically paid my way through law school without knowing it. And, but here's the thing, uh, yes. I, I regretted for decades giving up those speech notes. And one day, right after President Clinton's impeachment when I was in Congress, uh, I was going through some of my memorabilia and I saw page one. And that's when it hit me, oh my gosh. If, you know, even though I was like this fast-talking kid, if Ronald Reagan had not given those speech notes to me, I would never have been able to finish law school and go on to be a DA, a uh, congressman, and do you know, all these years of public service. And you know, I, just, I wish I could thank him for it. And about two weeks later, I'm going through this autograph catalog of stuff for sale. The guy that bought those notes died. They were up for sale. I sat up all night long, and I got them all back. <laughs> Anyway, those are just some of the stories. Uh, there's about 50 chapters, as I said. They're all short chapters in uh, the book. My publisher was very kind. They set up a, a little website, uh, which is goingrogan.com. And uh, it's got uh, information on the books. And uh, for those of you that <laughs> do read the book or read any of my books, you can email me. I love to hear from people, uh, only if you liked it. If you didn't like it, keep your opinion to yourself. It's really. <laughs> Uh, but I want to thank Sandy and the library for once again having me back for the kickoff of one of my books. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Rogan. Always welcome here at uh, the Nixon Library. Now, he's agreed to a few questions. Uh, if you have one, raise your hand, and I'll come over so that you can state your question on the mic. The one thing I have to say to everybody before I take questions, because I am a sitting judge, uh, the canons of judicial, judicial ethics preclude me from weighing in on any political uh, topic. So as a recovering politician, please don't do that to me. It's like waving a martini in front of a recovering alcoholic, but I just, I, I, I'm not going to be able to answer current political type questions. Yes, I have no idea if this falls into that category, but can you round up enough books to send to Congress the one about impeachment, catching the flag, as a manual for the folks that are there now? Oh, uh, next question. Yeah. <laughs> right over here. All right. <laughs> that, that was borderline. 
Well, Congressman, I uh, collect old political stuff as well, and uh, I remember doing the impeachment proce uh, process that they did an interview, CNN did an interview with you in your office, and you had all your memorabilia in the background, and I started building up my collection after that, and I've actually sold two items on Pawn Stars. And um, I wanted to ask, what was your most valuable item outside of the, the notes, which I'm sure are, in your collection? You know, I'm really not sure what would be the most valuable item, and I think most of you would, as you get older, you realize what's really valuable to you isn't necessarily the monetary value, it's the sentimental value. Uh, I love that convention seal. Uh, the reason I love it is because to get it, I had to shimmy up a pole uh, when nobody was looking at a pre-convention rally right after Agnew, the vice president, spoke there. I yanked it off the podium and I walked around. Uh, all week long in Miami and had people autograph it as I met them. And among the signatures I got on that was President Nixon, Congressman Gerald Ford, Ambassador George Bush, and Governor Ronald Reagan. And I got a bunch of other people on there. And throughout the week, Secret Service and guards would come up to me and say, where did you get that, where did you get that, where would you get that seal? And I'd say, oh, they're selling them over at the Fountain Blue Hotel, five bucks. <laughs> uh, so, you know, those are the kind of things that mean the most to me because there's a story that goes behind it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Nice uh, talk. I have two quick questions. One is, are you related to the sportscaster Rogan? And two is, how did your brother do in life with your tutelage? Uh, no relation to Joe Rogan, but if he, because he clearly makes more money than I do, if he wants to think I am related and leave me something in his will, I'm more than happy to claim uh, uh, ancestry with him. Uh, my, as far as how my brother Pat did, uh, I can just, I can only tell you this. My mom passed away a few months ago, and she was, in the words of one of her friends, a tough old broad. Uh, she smoked two packs a day for 60 years. She was the daughter of a longshoreman. She had a mouth on her that would just make your ears turn blue. And uh, she did, said whatever was on her mind and didn't care. And the night I got elected to Congress, uh, she's standing at the victory party, and she's smoking her cigarette, taking all of this in. And some reporter walked up to, the reporter told me the story. The reporter walks up to my mom, Alice, and says, uh, well, you must be very proud of your son today. And my mother looks at this reporter and said, well, I got three of them, honey. Which one are you talking about? And, <laughs> and the reporter says, well, come on, Mrs. Rogan. I mean, obviously, your son Jim just got elected to Congress, and you're a convicted felon. I mean, this is probably. And my mother, the reporter, my mother looked at this reporter and said, let me tell you something, honey. I got three boys. Patty's an engineer. Johnny's an engineer. I'm a convicted felon, and Jimmy's going to Congress. <sighs> Damn it, someone had to shame the family. <laughs> the, the young lady from Wilmington in the back of the room. Jo <coughs> Joanne Wysocki, teacher, 44 years. Do you have any feelings about what they say should be the standards all over the country for teaching? Yes, I have a lot of feelings about uh, what should be the standards uh, for teaching. And uh, the only problem is if I share them with you, I might run afoul of the Commission of Judicial Performance. And so I'll uh, let other people address those political uh, topics. I keep telling people when they ask me political questions, I'm a judge. I have no political feelings whatsoever. Why are you, a why are you asking me? <laughs> Sandy? Uh, I want to um, uh, acknowledge the presence of, uh, of Mayor Craig Young and his wife, uh, Sophie. Thank you. Sonia, thank you for coming. Mayor. Um, we want to leave Whose some son, Jake, is uh, here as a volunteer working for the library in the intern. back of the room. Yeah, Jake. There he is. Yeah. Um, now, uh, we want to leave time for book signing, which we will do uh, right outside the museum store in the, in the lobby. Uh, the books, of course, are now available in the museum store. So if you'd like Rough Edges or if you'd like any one of his trilogy, uh, the, the current one, uh, go into the store and get it and he'll, he'll sign it. We have a tradition, those of you who come frequently know that we always give a lavish gift. Um, <laughs> we used to give honorariums, they rather not have uh, that big a cash to take out of here, so <laughs> we replace the honorariums with these one-of-a-kind, limited edition, uh, uh, <laughs> custom made, <laughs> Uh, mugs. This one is What Would Nixon Do? And yes, coincidentally, it's available in our gift shop as well. 
but this treasure we're giving you, Jim, in hopes that you'll use it, uh, perhaps not on the bench. I don't know if you can do that on the bench. <laughs> what if, if every decision you said, well, let me decide this by asking what would Nixon do? Uh, thank you, as always, thank you, for Sandy. coming. Thanks Ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank all of you. God bless all of you, and God bless America.